All right. Well, it's 2 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and begin today's uh, webinar. So welcome again, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for today's webinar, The Mental Health, The Clinician's Perspective. This webinar is indeed brought to you by Children's Advocacy Center. My name is William Moore, and I'm with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention's National Training and Technical Assistance Center, and as your technical host, I would like to take a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of Adobe uh, Connect. My check one two. My check one two. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. I was experiencing some issues with my uh, here, but nonetheless, uh, just a few housekeeping items that I wanted to go over with you all uh, prior to uh, starting. Uh, please note that today's webinar is indeed being recorded. The webinar will be posted on Intax's YouTube page where you can view other archived webinars. For transcripts and supporting materials, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. For those wishing to download a copy of the PowerPoint slides and other important documents, do by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here, you will also find an FAQ for webinar participants that will likely address any technical related questions. Click on the name of the file and then click on the download button. At the end of today's webinar, there will be a Q&A session where presenters will address some of the questions posed in the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box as they arise. And for those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute to help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there's no need to type anything into the chat pod at this time. And I'll repeat that for if you could please type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you're viewing alone, there's no need to type anything into the chat pod at this time. Following today's webinar, attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance. This certificate is sent approximately one hour following the conclusion of the event and is sent via an Adobe Connect to email. Please keep an eye on your email for your certificate. Please note that only individuals who are virtually signed in into today's webinar will receive the certificate. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be provided with the link to provide a brief survey about today's presentation. The feedback you provide is used to assist in future planning and training. I will now turn today's webinar over to our moderator, Jennifer A. Rolls Roots, for today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, William. I'll take over from here. So I'm uh, Jennifer Rolls Roots, and I'm the project manager for the Rural Mental Health Initiative. And this is a project of the uh, Western Regional Children's Advocacy Center. Uh, we've been doing a series of webinars, uh, and today's webinar uh, is going to focus, obviously, on the administrative and clinical issues uh, of doing telemental health. We have uh, two presenters, and actually those pictures are flipped. So we have. Uh, uh, Al's picture on the right and, uh, and Chris's picture on the left. But we have Al Killen Harvey, uh, who is um, uh, the co-founder of the Harvey Institute and our lead trainer at the Chadwick Center for, Radi uh, for Children and Families at Radio Children's Hospital San Diego. And we also have Christopher Walsh, who's the director of clinical operations uh, at the Chadwick Center. 
So before we get started with a quick, uh, a brief kind of review of telemental health and then move into the content, we want to get uh, two quick polls. So, so let's go ahead and launch the first one, which is going to be on how familiar are you with uh, telemental health as a delivery option? So four response options. Never heard of it before this webinar, have heard of it, but don't know anyone who uses it, have not used it personally, but know of others who have, or have used it personally. We'll give a couple minutes there for folks to answer. And just a reminder to our audience, you can simply click on the box next to the option. Take your mouse and just simply click on the box next to your option. It looks like it's slowing down. Okay, do you want to go ahead and broadcast? William, are you able to broadcast results? Uh, no, I can, I can see the summary, so I can go ahead and, and read through it. So um, how familiar are you? Uh, the first one, about 10% said never heard of it before. About 25% have heard of it but don't know anyone who uses it. Uh, about 46% say they have not used it personally but know of others who have. And about almost 18% have used it personally. Great. Okay, and then we can go on to the next poll, which is to give us a little bit of a better idea of uh, the audience since we're doing clinical uh, discussion today. So a very quick question, are you, uh, now let's go back to the other poll, which is the, uh, that second one. Are you a mental health clinician? We'll keep this really simple. I think that'll help Al and Chris have a better idea of, as they're talking. Um, so either yes or no, are you, currently a clinician? Have you been a clinician you know, previously? Uh, so go ahead and pick that. Great. It looks like we've got some variety. And again, as a reminder to our audience, you can simply click on the circle next to your option. Okay, it looks like it's slowing down, so why don't we go ahead and broadcast. All right, so a little over two-thirds of people on the call are uh, mental health clinicians, about a third aren't, so good, um, good variety. So Al and Chris, you can keep that in mind when you're talking, and then we'll go ahead on to the next slide. Perfect. All right, so as I said earlier, the webinar is uh, being presented by the Western Regional Children's Advocacy Center as part of our Rural Mental Health Initiative. And the funding um, comes through OJJDP as part of the, our grant from uh, the U.S. Department of Justice. So why is the uh, Western Regional CAC interested in telemental health? Well, the main reason is that if you're familiar with the Western Region, Western Regional CAC covers uh, the Western states. It's a very large geographic area, and many of these communities are quite rural, frontier. Uh, you know, there are several, actually a good number of areas in Alaska that you can only get to through plain. Um, uh, there aren't roads that go there, et cetera. And many of the CACs that we work with are reporting having difficulty uh, providing mental health services. Uh, and then there's a, a core set of trauma-informed mental health services that are really crucial for CACs to be able to deliver uh, to meet the needs of their clients. So to try to address some of the, the, these concerns that we were having, the Western Regional CAC convened a group of experts uh, almost a year ago now uh, to start talking about what were some potential solutions and to come up with some kind of plan for how we could help 
uh, ensure that CACs, both in the Western region and other areas of the country, were able to deliver these evidence-based practices that are so needed for, the, for clients of the CAC. And part of what came out of that is looking at telemental health. So we'll start out today's call with a, a brief overview of what telemental health is um, and the research support for it. Um, and that will give you some idea of why this could be a really good option for people who need assistance delivering evidence-based mental health services. Uh, and then Chris and Al will talk in a lot more detail about some of the administrative, ethical, um, and clinical considerations to think about as you're um, developing or delivering telemental health services. Uh, we will have some time for questions at the end, so please be sure to use uh, the chat box uh, to enter any questions that come up uh, during the webinar so that we can address those. So why are people having trouble uh, delivering mental health services, especially trauma-informed and evidence-based? And what is the issue going on in, in the rural and frontier communities? So all of these issues, uh, when we think about barriers, we're looking at three main barriers, availability, accessibility, and acceptability. The first one, availability, is you know, do you have providers? Do you have the right people? So when we're looking at what, what CACs need to be providing, they're thinking about trauma-informed services and trauma-specific uh, treatments. So not every mental health clinician is going to have expertise in these. So availability of the right clinicians with the right experience becomes an issue. We also are looking at a, oftentimes a very young child population. Um, and again, not every clinician is experienced working with children. Uh, so in some rural areas where you're having a hard time just finding licensed mental health clinicians, now you're trying to find clinicians that are uh, you know, trained in trauma um, and also working with children. So your pool of providers is just very limited. Our, our second barrier that we'll group here is accessibility. Um, so this is really common things. Transportation, I think, is probably the biggest you know, access issue that we have. Uh, in the Western region, again, large geographic areas. Uh, so you're talking about having to get you know, drive an hour to get to the closest mental health provider. In some cases, it could be two or three hours. Um, weather is often a problem. Like I mentioned, entire communities in Alaska that you can only get to, um, you know, via plane. Um, and in the winter, you know, much more difficulty. You know, we hear from providers in places like Wyoming and Montana that depending on weather, you're going to experience um, quite a delay um, in getting access to services. And to be honest, even in our non-rural communities, um, accessibility is a problem. You know, uh, the Western Regional CAC is based in San Diego, and we don't have the greatest public transportation system. So if you have clients that need to take a bus to take mass transit to get there, it can take them, you know, over an hour, hour and a half uh, to get to our offices, depending on, on where they live. So accessibility is a problem. And then the last one, the last barrier grouping that we're looking at is acceptability. And this is just the willingness to access services in general. And unfortunately, we know that there's still uh, you know, quite an amount of stigma um, with regards to mental health services. And in, in, the, in the Western US, especially in rural areas, we often you know, have this feeling that um, you know, the, the residents there consider themselves pretty pretty tough, they're able to stand up to a lot of things, they're also pretty fiercely independent, want to take care of themselves. So we're also dealing with kind of this Western rural culture uh, that may be even less accepting um, of mental health services. And one additional issue in a small town, in a, in a small community, is that everybody knows everyone. So if you are seen walking into the mental health clinic in town, suddenly everyone in town knows you're going there. So privacy is often a concern um, in these small and rural communities where people don't even feel comfortable um, entering the building for fear of what the neighbors will think or what the neighbors will say. So obviously not only specific to rural areas, but, um, but definitely a particular issue there. So what is telemental health? Why is this an option? The, the, the main definition is, as it sounds, the use of telecommunications to provide mental health services across a distance. And there are many different ways you can do that. You may, have, uh, you, you may or, you know, use apps on your own or have heard of different um, 
devices. But our definition for the Western Regional Project is a two-way, real-time interactive communication between the patient and the clinician. And in this case, we're talking about video, some sort of video connection uh, between them so that they can communicate. And we're talking about the actual delivery of, of therapy services. Um, we've done a webinar, which you can access on the Western Regional site. Um, that gives you a lot more detail, but I'm going to briefly review what we know about the evidence supporting telemental health and then turn this over to Chris and Al for the, the main topic. But in summary, there are numerous randomized controlled studies, which are typically gold standard, um, that show that telemental health is very effective with adults. Uh, the VA in particular has been working um, in telemental, using telemental health now for many years. And there's also a growing evidence base um, that supports its use with children uh, and, and adolescents, and that they find it uh, even somewhat more acceptable than adults, probably because children are quite familiar uh, with technology. They're, they're using it all the time. So they actually find it less um, strange to be talking and doing therapy over video um, than in many cases adults or older generation may. In terms of the specifics, um, when it comes to doing your assessment over video, um, research has shown that it's acceptable to the patients and to their parents, and they've shown that there is no difference in the diagnoses or treatment recommendations that come from the video-based assessments when compared to face-to-face -face assessments. And I've got some citations there, um, and we'll have a citation list at the end. Uh, you're welcome to contact us if you'd like uh, more information on those. In terms of psychotherapy, again, assessment is a one-time you know, or maybe one or two visits, it's a short process. But therapy is taking place over weeks or months. So you'd obviously expect that uh, the rapport between the therapist and the client is more important, uh, and that video may cause a conflict there. But actually, again, numerous studies, and these are review studies that are listed here, that are showing the effectiveness of uh, telemental health-based psychotherapy uh, when compared to face-to-face -face therapy. And it's across multiple diagnoses. So we've got ADHD, anxiety, depression, trauma, et cetera. We're also seeing really promising retention rates. And we know that retention in services is such an issue in mental health that when you're trying to deliver an evidence-based practice, uh, you really do need the client to, to complete, or actually really any mental health treatment, you need the client to obtain enough services to have an impact. And so to see that uh, these the telemental health-based services are actually showing really good retention um, is great. All right, so it's not only the research that's showing this. There are clear standards and guidelines that exist across uh, multiple uh, professions, multiple areas now. Uh, so, so I've got some uh, copies of those there. Um, and basically, you'd want to start here. If you're thinking about delivering telemental health, you need to look at your own professional organization. What uh, does your um, particular organization support, or what do they say about the use of, of telemental health services as a way to get started? And when we talk about getting started uh, with uh, telemental health services, um, we're always going to think about the feasibility. So how easily or conveniently can telemental health be done in your particular situation? And so the focus of this webinar is going to be on the administrative, clinical, and ethical uh, concerns that, that you may have or some of those issues. And then we have a second webinar coming up in September that's going to cover kind of the legal regulatory issues and the technology. So when we talk about legal regulatory, we're typically talking about licensing, how you um, provide services across state lines, um, as well as some more specific le uh, legal issues like mandated reporting. And then obviously technology, it is telemental health. So we'd be looking at what are the um, technology requirements, how do you uh, ensure that you're meeting um, HIPAA regulations, et cetera, when you're delivering these services. So I am going to turn this over now to, whoops, sorry, go to the next one, sorry, to um, Chris and Al, who will take over from here. Okay. 
Uh, thank you so much, <clears throat> and we're very pleased to be here. Uh, we appreciate uh, everybody's interest in this uh, new and emerging way for us to, to reach more clients in a more effective way. Uh, the voice you're hearing right now is Al Killen Harvey, and I am a licensed clinical social worker, as Jennifer mentioned, here at the Chadwick Center and a lead trainer. And uh, just as a way of full disclosure, uh, I have not, uh, in my past experience as a clinician, did not work uh, using uh, telemental health, uh, but I have used it currently and do use it currently as a clinical supervisor, both for individual supervision and for group supervision. And uh, several of the clinicians that I supervise uh, also are using it currently for uh, direct client uh, interactions as well. So I have some general experience with it uh, and certainly have uh, done some research along with Chris uh, to, to help us sort of navigate our way through this new and emerging way to reach our clients. But, uh, and this is Chris Walsh, and I'm the Director of Clinical Operations here at the Chadwick Center for Children and Families. And uh, along with Al's full disclosure, I think it's important uh, to also indicate that uh, as we were approaching this, we were trying to think of uh, since neither one of us have extensive experience doing um, telemental health, uh, how, could, how could we even do this, uh, this webinar? And we thought it would be best to come at this as novices. We're, we are thinking a lot about this. We would like to implement this here at the Chadwick Center. Um, and so we started to dive into the topic. But we don't want to present ourselves as experts in this. Um, and there will be some issues that we would like to focus on today beyond the administrative, which is as a clinician, and we saw from the results of the poll that perhaps about two-thirds uh, on the um, webinar are actually clinicians. So we want to approach this as clinicians, and uh, we don't have the technology expertise. Um, we don't have some of the legal uh, and other issues that will be presented at other webinars, but we, we think like clinicians and we're going we're gonna to come at this webinar as if we uh, are clinicians. And one last kind of introductory comment and then we'll move more into the specific material. Um, for me and for the folks that I've worked with that are uh, currently utilizing uh, telemental health, I, I think as someone that has been in the field for a very long time, over 30 years now, um, I, I realized I had a lot of trepidation about telemental health. It really went against kind of the very grain and core of what I thought as a clinician was the way one should work, which is person to person, you know, in the flesh, if you will. Um, and, and so I was quite resistant to this, but I, I have to say that I am a, a, a quite a convert to uh, what it can do. And I think what's been most important for me, and we'll touch upon this as we move through the material today, is that really, in many ways, this is no different than any other innovation that's come across in our field, and there's been a lot. Um, most of us don't just work, for example, in a traditional psychotherapy office. We work sometimes in a, uh, uh, going into clients' homes. We work sometimes in a school-based setting. We work sometimes uh, in, a, you know, in, a, in a community center. Um, where the parameters and the logistics are completely different. And as clinicians, we learn how to adapt to that. Uh, and I think sometimes, uh, uh, as was alluded to before, this may be more a generational issue than anything else, because this is not our introductory or even our primary or most comfortable language for those of us of a certain age. But we are seeing a whole new generation where this is how they communicate. This is where they feel most comfortable. Uh, and in many ways, uh, we may actually get more out of sessions uh, with some of our clients because they're in a domain that actually is much more comfortable for them and less kind of sterile and foreign as our offices could be. So I just wanted people to kind of keep that in the back of their head as well as we move through some of the, the, the bigger macro pieces of this. Wonderful. All right, so then why don't we start with some of the administrative issues. And um, as indicated, we're not experts in the technology, and we know that in, in every state that there are going to be different uh, providers of services. We uh, here are using a Zoom-based ser uh, service that is HIPAA compliant, and I think one of the key uh, ideas here is that you make sure that whatever platform you're using that it is HIPAA compliant. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about documentation and developing um, policies and procedures around this, and then uh, touch on briefly reimbursement and billing, which is 
uh, something that, uh, again, for each state, and uh, uh, that's going to be something that is specific to uh, your locale. Go to the next slide. <laughs> this, is, this is a good example of the technology challenges that we have. All right, so some of uh, what we thought about when we first started to look into this is how can we um, approach some of the issues? Um, do we have a good uh, uh, broadband connections? Do we have a system that would work? How comfortable are we with using the system and the technology that it involves? And um, as uh, the Chadwick Center in particular is connected to uh, Rady Children's Hospital, and so there are regulations and concerns that go beyond uh, perhaps some of the other CACs in that we have to work within the hospital system. So uh, in that regard, we've uh, connected with IT and with uh, other departments within the hospital just to get a sense of how do we approach telemental health, uh, what are the concerns or uh, the logistics of doing something like this, how well does it fit in with hospital policies? And, um, and how well does it fit in with our, our technologies that we're using here? On an individual or uh, clinician level, uh, one of the suggestions that we have for the getting started, in addition to what Chris just talked about, is how familiar and how much practice do you have in any kind of uh, telecommunication? So for some of us, we may be periodically uh, involved in meetings on Zoom or on FaceTime or on other platforms that are out there to connect. If you're not, if that is still somewhat of a foreign territory for you, that would be our first suggestion. Start practicing, doing it with people that are not in your professional arena. Do it with friends, with family members. Uh, do it with, for those of you that are of a certain age generation, find some of your family members and friends that are of a younger generation and ask them to practice with you. Just getting familiar with what it's like to communicate with a screen in front of you instead of a face directly in front of you. Very simple and easy, but part of what clients will be looking for is our ease and our comfort with the technology as well. And if we look stiff or awkward or aren't quite sure where to look on the screen, the clients pick up on that as well. All right. Next slide. I think we can do this. Sorry. Documentation. Well, so with documentation, uh, we use electronic le uh, record system here at the hospital. Um, uh, part of uh, when we look at informed consent and some of the other forms that you will have to use, uh, you have to consider an, uh, the idea that everything is going to be online. And with uh, your particular uh, system, what we're using uh, would be an electronic signature, and that works with our particular system. What you need to think about here is how uh, uh, do you have to have paperwork that goes to the client? Do they fill that out? Um, or can you do this online and do this in a way that uh, is acceptable to um, your insurance that you're going to be using? you have any other no, thoughts about that? Good. I think we're just going to move to that one. Okay. Developing policies and procedures. Um, Jennifer had indicated earlier that there are a number of guidelines that are now out there that you can review. Part of that would be to look at those guidelines that fit with your particular discipline. Um, uh, the guidelines are pretty specific in terms of establishing uh, policies, especially around confidentiality, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, that seems to be one of the main concerns, uh, just making sure that, uh, that, uh, that the signal that's going across is uh, going to be encrypted and that uh, it maintains confidentiality. Uh, not all platforms are HIPAA compliant, and so that's going to be a key piece of that. And regardless of uh, which of those that you take a look at, 
uh, obviously the important thing is that you do have a policy and a procedure. Uh, for liability purpose-wise, particularly when you are uh, introducing a new way of practicing and when it is not necessarily being used universally across your client population, uh, if there is ever any question as to why you use this particular uh, form of communication and, and connection with the client and what were the standards that were set up around that, it is important that you have something in writing, not just that you have an understanding internally or your organization agrees to practice around this, but to get it in writing uh, that, that is clear, consistent, and that everybody agrees to, um, that, that will be a source of a tremendous support for you down the road should there be challenges. Reimbursement and billing, and uh, I know there's going to be a webinar about this and we'll go into far more detail, um, but this uh, is something that obviously we're all going to be concerned about, and in part it's uh, does the uh, insurance uh, provider, do they allow for telemental health? Um, how, how many sessions do they allow under telemental health? Um, and um, in, I know in a number of states there's are agreements to go across state lines, but that's not universal. And so that is something you, you're going to have to discover state by state until there are more universal or national standards around this. Um, but I, I think uh, otherwise, um, at this point, it's really up to each um, clinician and wherever you live to really re review and understand uh, your local uh, regulations around that. And obviously communication with your client around that as well. Uh, you don't want to start the practice and then find out that the sessions you've now had are not reimbursable and the client is, is responsible for those. So again, it's our responsibility up front to know what, what the regulations are, what the reimbursement uh, uh, regulations are, and whether or not this technology fits under that particular client's uh, reimbursement plan. Ethical concerns. All right. Um, so the first issue that came to us when we were discussing some of this is is, is in and around the ethical concerns uh, about doing this kind of treatment. Al indicated that part of this is just our getting used to this as a um, a platform for service. Uh, it is different. It's not. Uh, we're looking into a computer screen right here. Um, it is not a patient right across from us. Um, most of us, at least of our generation, are much more familiar with working with somebody in a face-to-face, -face, direct way. Um, and so uh, a number of questions started to spring up for us as we thought about uh, doing telemental health, and many of them had to do with ethical concerns. For example, not all clients are going to be appropriate for this type of service. Obviously, you're going to have some clients who are really uh, in, a, in a crisis uh, state um, and uh, they may not be quite ready for the services that uh, we might provide. You have uh, clients that may have significant uh, or severe personality disorders. They would not be appropriate for some of this, uh, this type of work that we're doing. Also, the age of a child. Um, Many of you may practice using uh, play therapy or other types of techniques for younger children. Obviously, you won't be able to do some of that uh, through via telemental health. And in fact, in researching some of this, one concern that came up for some providers was that with younger children, they look at the screen um, and they see a, a, a mental health clinician, but they think it's a television program and not a, not a service that's being delivered. So there are challenges in terms of uh, who is appropriate for these services. Um, uh, Al, did you have any other thoughts about that? The only other thought I had, and I'm, I'm going to take this in a completely different direction, but uh, again, just as I've been kind of wrestling with this, when we thought about ethical concerns, obviously Chris is talking at the micro level at, at, at individual clients and, and how we have to kind of wrestle with those. Um, I would suggest, and here you're hearing the voice again of a convert now, I would suggest that as a field, however, we are now at a, at a point where we have to look and say, because we have technology that does now allow us to reach into geographic areas and other arenas that we didn't before, how can we not embrace that and move forward? How can we not bring the work that we're doing to populations that couldn't come to us in the past 
when we now have a, a, a mode that allows that to happen. So I think looking at ethical issues on a, on a more macro level as well, that is why I think we are uh, such proponents of moving this forward. I think as a field, we have an ethical responsibility now to bring our work to as many people as possible, utilizing whatever technology or means or modes that, that is available to us. And we now have this amazing way to do it. No, I think that's an excellent point, particularly because you have people who uh, concentr are concentrated in, say, uh, a city who have the expertise to provide this kind of treatment, and that expertise just isn't available out into the more remote areas. And it speaks to the bigger issues of disproportionality and et cetera, because uh, uh, certain areas geographically or financially or economically or culturally uh, haven't had the privilege of, of access to our work. And now we have an opportunity to finally start to even the playing field around that. The next issue is uh, informed consent. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. I think as most of the clinicians online probably recognize, we. We have extensive uh, informed consents that look at things uh, like uh, the expectations around uh, therapy, uh, the responsibility to, as mandated reporters, to uh, break confidentiality in, in cases of uh, the clients uh, wanting to hurt themselves or hurt someone else, et cetera. I, I think the thing to add here and to think about is when we are uh, doing telemental health, this is actually uh, the, the video camera is going to be in the patient's or the client's home. And so to make the client fully aware and the family fully aware that um, we're going to be viewing their room or the living room or wherever this is going to be set up. Um, and uh, it's similar to those who do in-home support therapy. Um, you're actually going into the home and you need to be able to help them become aware of the reality of that. So I, I think beyond that, um, most of uh, what we're looking at in terms of informed consent is pretty standard. So let's uh, look at the idea of confidentiality as well. We can advance the slides because I think we've moved a, a yeah. bit. Yeah, great. Uh, this is a, one of the for me, anyway, in, in having these discussions, this is one of the areas that I hear the most amount of concern from my uh, uh, my colleagues. Uh, you know, how do we control for this? Uh, it's not my office. I don't know where the client is. I don't know who's within earshot. Um, and, and that is a reality, absolutely. And that is a vulnerability uh, in this, in that we as a clinician are not controlling the environment uh, fully. That being said, again, as I mentioned earlier, that is not unique. Uh, many of us have been in situations where we practice in, in places that weren't fully under our control. And so you do the best that you can. You, you, uh, you talk to the client very directly and specifically about the boundaries and the importance of those boundaries and have that conversation up front. Uh, I've had experiences of, of some of the clinicians that I supervise reporting that some of their clients uh, may use an iPad uh, or their phone, uh, which for, for many folks is their, their means of communication these days, and they're doing it while they're uh, standing in the grocery line, um, or they're in their car, but they have the windows down and they're in a parking lot with people walking by. Um, th this is an area of concern, understandably, but that takes a conversation. So as we begin, like we would as, as, as somebody enters my, my traditional psychotherapy office and I orient them to the office and how it works, I'm going to orient them to, to this practice as well by saying, I think it's important that you be in a place that's private, uh, even though you and I are, are the only two that are going to be listening to this conversation. Nonetheless, imagine creating a space where no one else can hear you, where also you're not going to be distracted by things. That's the other uh, situation. Because it is so highly mobile, this means of communication, clients sometimes have a, uh, a tendency to move with it as well. They'll talk to you. I had one a clinician report that uh, one of their clients would do their sessions while driving to their work environment. Probably not a great idea, so we want to have a conversation about that. But again, this, this requires communication. I think in part it's the, uh, helping people um, move from the idea of using this kind of uh, medium, what they might do every day, uh, to an understanding that they're doing therapy. So it would be very similar to being in a therapist's office. So the, the driving, for mm -hmm. example, would be a good, uh, to me, someone might do something like that, although they shouldn't probably, while driving, and it's very casual, or, 
or in the grocery line, they might think that uh, chatting with someone is perfectly okay. It's really helping them understand that it's not. And, you know, there are other, other issues as well um, with technology, and, and this is actually something that's happened to me personally. There's the capacity here for patients to um, uh, actually record or um, um, yeah, somehow record the session as it's going along, and that, that happened to me uh, without my knowledge. And so you have to think about really help, helping to set parameters and boundaries around some of this. I've had clients who want uh, teenagers who think it's okay for a friend of theirs to sit in on the session. Um, you wouldn't necessarily know that that's the case unless you've uh, directly talked to them about and set up uh, these conditions beforehand. The same thing is uh, for family members who may want to know uh, what's going on in the session. Uh, this can particularly be a problem if you have an older teenager you're working with. You want to make sure that they have a private space within their home uh, or if it's within a school setting where they can uh, do this, uh, have this uh, session, but uh, that there's also, we know from our end, that there's support uh, if we need to call somebody to help out. Well, for those that can see us on, on the video, you're going to see we're not exactly the youngest of clinicians. And this actually, this topic of clinical and te uh, technological competence came up uh, pretty early in our conversation. Um, we recognize that most likely the patients or clients that we're going to be working with are probably going to be more comfortable with this technology than we are and more competent at, at operating it. And that goes to that control issue you were talking earlier about, Al. You know, it, it, the client may know more how to, to make this platform work than we do, and that's just going to increase our anxiety, I think, in, and, and the discomfort in, in working with the medium. I think there are other issues as well we're going to talk about when it comes to using this platform uh, when we get into the actual clinical work. But uh, just for now, I know from a personal standpoint, I'm not completely comfortable with the technology yet, and so that's going to be something I've <clears throat> committed myself to really learning and understanding better so that there's a, a greater degree of uh, comfort just using this as a, as a medium to do therapy. Right. So it's, it's like the age-old uh, Carnegie Hall uh, joke, uh, how the, you know, what's it going to take for us to get there, and it's going to be practice, 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 right? Uh, that's what we're going to have to do for those of us where this is not a native uh, kind of way for us to operate. It just requires a lot of practice and experimentation. This was an obvious uh, concern very early on as well. What happens um, if you have a client within your office who uh, moves uh, into a place of crisis uh, most clinicians um, have experienced this and, and have procedures and protocols for, for managing that. Uh, uh, here we call a, a, a local psychiatric emergency response team that can come and evaluate for the need to hospitalize a child, for example. Um, but what happens if this uh, person is in a remote location? Um, in part of the initial paperwork, uh, to me uh, that we have to make sure you cover is to make sure we know all of the emergency numbers local, uh, locally, uh, anybody that we may be needing to contact have a very clear list. Um, but it, it creates a lot of anxiety, at least for me, I don't know about you, Al, uh, just knowing that we're going to be working with clients who, who have, uh, may have very strong reactions to some of the work that we're going to be doing. It's not easy work. Uh, they're going to be triggered, and we want to make sure that we have procedures in place, protocols in place that we can respond despite being hours away from the client. And this is one of those areas where this is a little bit different than in, in the ways that we've worked before because uh, most of us work in an office in a community that we're very well familiar with the resources in that community. Here we may be working with somebody in a community that we don't know as well. And so part of our homework has got to be to understand what are the resources available if I have to reach out to somebody somewhere else or get, have my client reach out to somebody because of what's happening for them. That's going to take some upfront work, and that's our responsibility and part of our ethical requirement when doing 
doing this kind of practice. Yeah, and I think initially in the early sessions, uh, we'll, you'll have to spend some time really understanding what those local resources yeah. are before really starting the, uh, the clinical work, getting too deep into that. Um, I know in school settings, for example, there's a designated person who is available uh, to come in and, and support the child if uh, a crisis arises. The same thing would be uh, to set up at, at home, that there's a parent, a caregiver, somebody who is in the home at the time where you're doing the therapy, that that's agreed upon, understood that you have the, uh, the phone number of that person that you can bring into the session should that be necessary. Just a short amount of time left because we want to leave some time for questions as well, and we do encourage you to ask questions. Um, but we'll touch on just a few more items before we wrap up. Yeah. All right. Well, I actually, um, so in in looking at some of this, uh, doing this as a, a clinician, I can tell you the first thing that came to my mind is uh, as I look on an, uh, a screen, I'm, I'm, this is a very practical kind of thing. Where do you look? <laughs> in terms of the screen. I'm very used to paying a lot of attention to uh, a client's, uh, the micro expressions of a client, the, the, um, the affect of display that you might um, experience during the course of, of therapy. When I look online and I see even our video, um, what I often will see is pixelation, a slight delay, uh, a, um, a breaking up of the signal. And I find that real uh, distracting and uh, discomforting. I don't know about the rest of you, but that was something that I was very concerned about. Even where do I look on the screen? Because if you, if you have a client and you have a larger display, um, the tendency is to look directly at the face on the screen, but that is not where the camera is, and it's not what your client will see. So, what Al had indicated earlier about practicing is actually very important. Practicing and just getting a sense of where to have the video uh, placed on your screen as close as you can to the camera so that the client seems to be looking directly at you and you directly at the client. Great. Um, the, a couple of the other issues, and this is something you brought up before, but I, um, you know, typically in a private practice setting or a, a community setting, office setting, um, you go and greet your client in the waiting room and you walk them back to your office. And even in that short span of time, you're gleaning all kinds of important clinical information about how they're moving, um, how they're engaging with you as they walk back to the office. Well, here you're going to sit down and you turn on your screen and your client is right there in front of you. So you don't even get to have that uh, sort of uh, preliminary information about how they may be doing that day, uh, how they're moving, um, uh, the affect that comes across uh, in, those, in those moments. So uh, these are some of the early uh, thoughts that I have. And even um, if depending on where you are on, this, on the um, uh, screen, the, the client may or, may or may not be able to see gestures. Uh, now, we're far enough away, you can see a little bit of my gesture, but you may not be able to see the client's gestures at all, so their body language is a bit different. Um, uh, you may not see a smooth uh, uh, and, and um, what do you call it, uh, accurate read of, of their facial expressions. Um, and I even thought the, about in, with certain clients when I'm working with them, particularly around trauma, as you move into some of that, uh, the space between you and the client is not something that you can easily regulate, um, uh, where in my session I can move back uh, a little bit further away, we can adjust that space. Um, and then even simple things like, uh, I'm sure most of you have Kleenex and water in, available to your client, and you can't hand them the Kleenex or the water uh, in, in this kind of uh, modality. And one last thing, uh, kind of the reverse of what Chris was talking about, uh, is uh, bearing in mind the client is watching us as well and watching what's in our space. Um, again, if we uh, set up a routine where I'm always in the same space where I'm doing my telemental health, so the client sees the same background as you are all seeing right now, but if I move around, 
Remember, like clients in our office, when we move something in our office or, or move our office completely, how dysregulating it can be for some of our clients. They're used to looking at a certain space in the office when they need to dissociate for a little while or when they need some kind of nurturance. They are going to be picking up on that on our screen as well. So be very cognizant of being in the same place uh, in, in, in geographically in your office or wherever you're doing the, the practice from because the client may be using things in the background as a source of support or comfort for them as well. Um, how we just, I think we are. Yeah. So we are noticing um, the time and we did want to allow some time for, for questions. Um, so on that we're going to end our kind of formal presentation uh, and uh, let you kind of direct us in terms of what else you'd like us to, to touch upon. Jennifer, I think you were going to... Sorry, I had myself on, on mute, so... There we sure. go. Great. Um, the, the challenges of technology. <laughs> also make sure you're yeah, not on mute sorry. talking with the client. <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. Okay. So um, one question that I had, Al, is um, uh, to talk about supervision. And so you uh, discussed uh, supervision. And this has definitely mm -hmm. been an issue in our uh, that's come up in the rural areas. It, uh, that many clinicians who are very isolated, who may be the only clinician in an area, um, that video conferencing-based supervision could be of great benefit for them. Um, so can you talk a little bit about doing supervision over um, uh, video? Yes, absolutely, and I really appreciate you mentioning that. Right, so it's not only our clients <laughs> uh, in, in rural and frontier and in other places that are feeling isolated and alone. It's many times the, 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 uh, the psych our psychotherapeutic colleagues that are out there. Many times they may be the only clinician within a very large geographic range, uh, and it's very challenging. They don't get a lot of access to resources to support for what they're doing. And so uh, using telemental health as a way to provide clinical supervision um, or even peer support. So if you are in a rural or frontier area right now, uh, uh, I encourage you uh, to make connection with some of your colleagues that may be in other parts of uh, either your state or the country. Uh, you, you can also talk to us uh, uh, through the RAC grant as well uh, and form some partnerships and use this technology as a way to break that isolation. Share cases with each other. Talk about what are the unique challenges uh, not only of doing trauma work, but of doing trauma work in, in communities where there may be very limited resources. Um, I, I have found the, the supervision um, for, for, uh, for clinicians through telemental health to be so rich and rewarding. Uh, you, you've already won just by, by, by having the faces on your screen, uh, whether it's once a month or how often uh, you, you meet. I can see it in the clinician's eyes, just this idea of, oh, Somebody else gets this. I've, I've had to talk by myself uh, about this issue. I talk to somebody who's empathic, but they're not a clinician and don't understand the real struggle that I'm up against. And to see another clinician, on, even on a screen, and hear them kind of mirror your story is, is so validating and supporting. Great. Thanks, Al. Uh, uh, several people have uh, texted in uh, questions about when it's um, not appropriate to use telemental health or when it would be counterindicated. Can you or Chris talk more about that? Uh, yeah, uh, let's go first with the, the, the obvious stuff. Uh, if a client is uncomfortable with it, you know, we've talked about how many times uh, clinicians may be uncomfortable and we that's part of our job is to work to get more comfortable. Some of us may never use this technology because we just won't ever feel that comfortable with it. Similarly, some of our clients won't. And to force a client into a modality that doesn't work for them obviously is, is not what we want to do. So having a conversation with a client uh, by saying, how often have you used any kind of uh, uh, internet or, or telecommunication? What do you think it would be like to have our, uh, our experience together done that way? Uh, is that something you're willing to try if you've not done it before? So you might want to try it on a test basis with somebody that's never done this before to see. But always respect if somebody goes back and says, you know, I, I, I could force myself into it, but it's never going to feel right for me, then we need to respect that. So that would be my first um, thing to screen for is clients' comfort around it. And are even if they're not comfortable being, are they willing to try? But if they give the no from the beginning, I, I need to respect that. Chris, you want to talk diagnostically? You've made some allusions already about some things that maybe we need to at least 
take into consideration around appropriateness? Yeah, I think uh, when thinking about this as well, it's just uh, what I think a lot about is is really is the client in a place where um, they uh, are too fragile uh, and um, and the safety or sort of this the yeah the safety issues are just too great of a concern. So if there's severe um, uh, suicidal ideation, uh, significant personality issues uh, that may really uh, create a, a dynamic where they're constantly in a crisis. Um, I, I would be very concerned about really bringing those clients into and trying to do telemental health. It may have to do primarily with my, I'm just not used to doing that, um, but uh, I would be very concerned about uh, bringing those clients in uh, under this platform. Okay, a couple other questions. Let's see if we can get to a couple more minutes. Um, we had someone talk about um, any thoughts on using texting or email to support video sessions. I know that there are a lot of apps that do that, that automatically contact people uh, and can send reports back to the clinician, but I don't know if Chris or Al, do you have any experience or thoughts about using texting or email to support uh, you know, in between the sessions? Um, a couple of things come up. Obviously, first and foremost is you know uh, safety, security, and HIPAA uh, 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 concerns around that. So when you again, anytime we're using a, a modality outside of uh, being in, in the actual in the session with a client, we have to really think through to what degree is this protected, to what degree is there vulnerability for this information to be uh, 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 inadvertently or maybe uh, uh, specifically targeted by someone else that shouldn't have access to it. So. I, I, that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. I also think um, the good news of this technology that is allowing us to reach people in ways bef that we didn't before and with a generation that's more comfortable with that, that being said, there is also challenges that sometimes boundaries get lost in all of this. <laughs> Just because we have abilities to communicate um, much more easily with each other 24-7 doesn't necessarily mean that we should be. Um, so we have to look at, if I open up another means of communication, what are the boundaries around that? Am I giving out my own number? Am I encouraging clients to, um, to, to message me between sessions when in other situations I would never do that? Um, there, there's no reason to do that other than in a crisis situation. Am I fostering a sense of you really should be communicating with me more frequently? Am I going to be able to bill for that if that text goes from two sentences to something that takes me 20 minutes to read? Now is that something that I bill for? Do I bring that into the session the next time? Is that really a quasi-session? Um, the, the, this is all kind of what we, we have to sort of ferret out now um, because of the good news of the multiple ways that clients can can communicate with us and we could communicate with them. Chris, any other okay, great. No, I, I, think, I think really the key here as well is that you just want to make sure that the, whatever you're doing, whether it's email or texting, that you're, you're maintaining uh, the confidentiality, that you're, use, you're encrypting it or you're using some kind of platform that, that uh, maintains that privacy. Great, thanks. Um, I know we're almost out of time. We've had a lot of other questions that have come in over the chat. So what I can do is um, get some answers to those. There are a lot of questions about CPT codes, um, mm -hmm. about, et cetera. So I will get the uh, full list of the chat questions from, uh, from William at NTAC, and I will get answers to those posted on the um, Western Regional CAC website, where you'll have a link to the recording as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to get that out for folks. And um, as you may have seen in our chat, Western Regional is also developing a web-based telemental health resource center that we're hoping will go live uh, probably late September. Uh, and we'll have uh, very, links to more detailed information about all of these topics that we've covered today. Uh, so be looking for that. And I think at this point, looking at our timing, I'm going to turn it over to William to wrap us up. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Jennifer. And thank you again to our presenter for such a wonderful and very interesting uh, topic. And I'm uh, providing our audience with very, very important information. 
Before we uh, go, I just have a few brief announcements for everyone. I wanted to please remind everyone that on September 18th, uh, WRCAC will indeed have another webinar. Uh, it was referenced a few, a few times in today's uh, webinar as well. Please note that the uh, registration or where you can sign up is live here. Uh, it's also live a live link located in your handouts pod as well for the presentation for today's webinar. Uh, you may contact INTACT through the website displayed on this slide. You can stay up to date on the latest information by signing up for INTACT's TTA listserv. Also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook at OJJDP TTA. And you may also contact OJJDP via the help desk by following the contact information on this slide. Do you have a training and technical assistance need? Well, if so, please visit OJJDP's TTA 360 platform to submit a request for help. As a reminder, the webinar recording will be posted on OJJDP's Intact YouTube channel, and you can contact the OJJDP TTA help desk for the transcript and any other supporting materials. If everyone could, please take a few seconds to review the disclaimer here. And lastly, we would appreciate if you all could please take about five minutes to complete the feedback survey. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.